Welcome everybody, my name is Eruption Fang, and this is episode 7 of Genlock, titled, It Never Rains. So our characters are on the run from the Union, who keeps managing to track them down, and we get what is a very mellow and relaxing scene. Val's playing the guitar, which she learned through mind-melding with Kazu, and Kazu doesn't want to do it again due to what may be learned. Kami makes the moment a bit more comedic, saying she has nothing to hide. But at the end of the day, I'm with Kazu. I think everyone has secrets for a reason, and they should be allowed to have secrets for whatever reason. Whether they feel guilty or responsible of something that happened in the past, they're embarrassed about something, ashamed, anything. It's not the character's place to essentially extract this information against their will. I believe all of these characters, even Kami, has something they would prefer not be known by the others. I don't know why I like this beginning scene so much. I can't exactly place my finger on it, but it just felt so natural. It felt like they were actually bonding. They felt like they were friends and not colleagues who were paired for the program. As good as some moments were in the previous episodes, this one's different. Meanwhile, Chase is having an existential crisis as Nemesis speaks to him, questioning whether or not they're even human anymore. This moment, however, is quickly interrupted as they are tracked down once again. Kami figures out it's because Nemesis is linked to Genlock that they're being tracked, and so Chase redownloads and they can have a chat. So, without Weller, the game plan is in question. Val wishes to abandon it, Kazu wishes to destroy it, while others wish to keep it going. Fortunately, before anyone makes an immediate decision, Caliban comes online and Chase activates him where we see a message from Weller. Basically, what is said is that Caliban has a sliver of Weller's neural pattern and he's been constantly updated with Genlock's plans. So even without Weller there, the journey can continue. He then says his goodbyes and he's sorry that he couldn't witness everything conclude. Now I believe Weller is dead. Last episode I thought it was a bit abrupt, didn't seem like he was actually gone. This one was more of a send off. Also not really because Caliban still got the voice, so David Tennant is still part of the cast. So to me it's also like, why though? Like Caliban has his own different style of humor, very dull, it's like anti-humor. But Caliban doesn't have the same charm that David Tennant could give Weller by essentially being himself. But I'll get back to this later. Anyway, the plan is to visit Artasa in the middle of nowhere. Nope, not that nowhere. Or maybe that nowhere. That animated universe theory is an ever-evolving theory. Anyway, they run into Henry, who then introduces them to Dr. Ja. We learn that she used to be married to Weller, and she more or less knows about the going-ons of Genlock. She then introduces them to Mark Holcroft, the principal investor in the ESU and Artasa. Much like our main crew was earlier, he's a bit uncertain on what to do with Genlock without Weller present, so our characters propose they should first stop Nemesis, to which he agrees. After that, then they'll figure something out. So, Kami lies about her job and we get some new and improved redesigned mechs. Chases is very fitting, though I will say, I like the original Chases more. Kami is of course a rabbit, I love that Kazu's been made into a Shogun, Val's more or less looks the same, and Yez kind of looks like Bumblebee from Transformers. Despite not really knowing anything about these characters, all their Holons seem very fitting, but Yaz is still an enigma. I don't know what this says about her, or how this relates to her personality as all of the other ones do with theirs. Obviously we'll learn, no need to pose that comment, but the rest of the cast have managed to deliver something that speaks to who they are, but Yaz, even despite being given a lot of screen time, still a mystery. The only thing I'm not keen on with these new Holons is the color. Like, the saturation on these things looks insane. They're so vibrant. That is all. In terms of Holcroft, I don't really trust him. The introductions that he made did not help his case, to be fair. Because he could either just be a dick, or he was just a scapegoat to deliver the audience information about the characters. Which was that scene's purpose. But it's like, does that reflect who he is? Or is that just the story? I don't think he's Union or anything like that, but I feel as though he's looking out for his own self-interest. Business first, you know? If he can make money, he will. I just don't trust businessmen is what I'm really getting at. In terms of Dr. Ja, it seems like she's going to be replacing Weller. But going back to what I was talking about earlier, why though? I'm not even that big of a David Tennant fan, never watched Doctor Who, the only thing I've ever seen him in was Jessica Jones. But even I know his charm and charisma supersedes even the main cast combined. Like it's not natural, he's not human. So to get rid of him and like his character, I really do question that decision considering the plot's not really changed at all. Anyway. 
Yaz also seems to have a thing for Chase, which at this point I will say I'm actually really down for. Because that love triangle between Chase, Jody, and Miranda, no, not at all. I hated it. But since then, things have changed. The way things are shaping up to be right now looks like this. Yaz likes Copy Chase. Copy Chase likes Miranda, Jody likes Miranda, but Miranda likes original Chase. From what I gather, that's sort of what's happening. I'm a fan of the idea of these two different characters having feelings for practically the same person, but ideological differences for the two different people. I like the prospect that Yaz is capable of looking past the idea that Chase is a copy and sees him as his own person, while Miranda isn't capable of that. You know, they both like the same person, but not in a love triangle way. Though that right now is just an idea, until we see Miranda and how she's dealing with everything, we don't know. But until that time, that's sort of the headcanon I'm rolling with now. Because for me, so long as it's capable of doing something unique, or it's able to bring something greater to the table in terms of the show's ideas and message, then I can 100% enthusiastically get behind that. But if it's just gonna be some romance drama in a mech show, then no thank you. In the end, I think this episode was totally different than all of the other ones we've gotten in a good way. So far, they've all been pretty action-packed and a fast pace, but here they've actually stepped on the brakes a bit, which is shocking considering there's only one more episode left. Now that probably will be as action-packed as you'd imagine a finale would be, but I don't know that for sure. I like that this episode managed to make it feel as though these characters are actually beginning to form a connection with each other in a figurative sense. Yes, Genlock literally connects them mind and body, but that bond is something you can't force. And it really felt like they were becoming friends. I'd be shocked if Nemesis is taken down next episode. He seems more like a multi-season long enemy to me. But I really enjoyed how things went at a bit more calmer of a pace. And it may be right there next to episode 2 with how I enjoyed it. But goddammit, do I hate Henry.